a very important Good Morning Britain story this morning mm. about police vetting. The government is expected to announce at 9.30 that they have recruited 20,000 more yep. police officers compared to a few years back to get back to the level they inherited in 2010. But the interesting question is, are they cutting corners or having mm. to go um, be, be slipshod in the way they're doing the recruiting to get to those numbers? And it seems as though even two years after the tragedy of the Sarah Everard murder and then the revelations about um, uh, Carrick, the, um, the rapist who was a yeah. police officer, despite that, there's very inconsistent standards being applied by forces across the country. I, look, I think people, a lot of people have lost complete faith in the police, particularly women. It's terrible. Mm. Uh, and um, it's great that they've got these 20,000 back, but they lost so many experienced police officers. It was on Theresa May's watch. We should never forget it when she was Home Secretary. Yeah. And I think it is shaming that a Tory government did it. What the UK Conservative so government is, is it's restoring a cut. Yeah. They're not extra, it's, it's exactly. bringing back bodies. But well, thank God they're back. Are the bodies coming back as good as the bodies they got? Well, no, because they're not as experienced. Shot. But you would have thought on vetting there should be a national standard. So, for it's... example, according to... Because um, Louisa James, our uh, political correspondent, sent a freedom of information request to the police forces in England and Wales, and, and it threw up this disparity. In last year, um, the numbers vetted who failed in Cleveland, for instance, the police force in Cleveland, 15% of those vetted failed. In Hertfordshire, 13%. In Norfolk and Suffolk... 1%. Mm. Now, is that because they just got better people overall in Norfolk and Suffolk and so only a few fail the vetting or is it because they just don't have a high enough standard of vetting in know. those police forces? That's, that's what you want to know and we don't, we don't know. know. Yep. I mean, that, that is it. It, it. Is it better to have a f high vetting failure rate it's been turned away or a low one who, yes. who are you uh, i think you want a high betting rate because of the failures we've seen in the police whether it's Ev the everard case mm. that mm. terrible carrick the the, the um, uh, we have the chief inspector coming on to talk about this in in half an hour he did a report last year in 2022 into examples of failed vetting between 2018 and 2021. The examples of people who became police officers include a police officer who was allowed to join despite robbing an 80-year-old woman who was knocked to the ground, had her handbag stolen, um, a, uh, a support officer who was cleared after slapping his partner in the face, an officer who was cleared to join despite an, a rape, uh, um, an arrest for rape while a juvenile 20 years ago, Police officer clear to join despite concerns he had a theft conviction and potential criminal links. So when we talk about, you know, different standards of vetting... There should I be mean, one standard. The issue is, are we allowing people like this <clears throat> yeah. to become police officers? Because that was what was found yeah. just a couple of years I, ago. I would say in each one of those cases, that person shouldn't become a police yeah. officer. However, if in a very earlier part of your life, and in maybe difficult circumstances, you were done for shoplifting, even might have got into a fight or nicked somebody's bike, I'm not... A, no, I'm not just saying these things shouldn't count. Rape. But if you've changed... No, yeah, well, rape. of course, that is the clearly... Look, no, you can't be a How police officer. How can you get through vetting? I know. But, you, but, other, but other people, if they've at one point done something wrong and might have a conviction, it doesn't mean throughout your life that should be... Thing. And, and we know, and don't yeah. we know recently that there are rapists in the Metropolitan Police Well, do you remember I spoke to um, um, uh, yeah. the Convicted. head, yeah. the top Metropolitan Police Officer... Yeah. ..and asked, can, if I go into a police station, if I report a, a, a crime, sex crime, how do I know yeah, yeah. that yeah, yeah. the right. person who is taking that account who's, is, mm -hmm. is not themselves mm -hmm. accused of, suspected of... Mm -hmm. A similar crime or domestic abuse? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't able to rule that it's possibility appalling. out. So maybe we need far more women police yeah, but officers. What, but one of the pro one of the problems, there are not people literally queuing outside to knock the door down to become a, a police officer because the, the pay and the conditions are not uh, fantastic. Well, the, it's also the reputational yeah, damage. But you also have you know, anti-social hours. You're dealing with people uh, who are often the most troubled in society or the nastiest in society. It's well, they, very, very, they, diff they, it's a very they, difficult job. And they become social workers. Yeah. That's part the, of the problem. Well. Uh, well they, they become social. So, yep, they do. Oh, dealing they, with mental they, health. They, that's yeah. part. But, oh, uh, I see. Well, that, that's what I mean. And uh, and that they they should be doing. That's the job of the uh, social uh, services, uh, not the police. The thing uh, I understand is why why do we have a voluntary code of conduct 
which some police forces can decide not to enforce. Why doesn't the Home Secretary say yeah. there are police vetting standards which apply universally and everybody's yeah. got... Well, I agree with you. Well, well, it, it, but, you know, there's always been this uh, national pull or contradiction, if you like, between the Met stand, and standards a... across the country and then the idea of but having local GM... police forces yeah. which have a degree of independence. But You've got to get the balance right. Poses the problem with that approach. Yeah. Well, it's a postcode lottery, the kind of police yeah. officer you might yeah. get. Yeah. We'll talk to the Home Secretary about that uh, after eight. The issue here is that although there is a set of guidelines for police vetting, it is up to individual police forces to decide how to interpret and implement them. And figures we've uncovered suggest that that is not being done consistently across the country. So we asked all 43 forces in England and Wales how many potential new recruits failed vetting since 2019, and around half responded to us. Now, vetting looks at things like criminal convictions, social media, family connections and finances. And the figures we got back show some police forces failed a much higher proportion of candidates than others. So last year, for example, uh, these forces told us they failed under 2% of those who went through vetting, while in other areas, you can see here, it was as high as 15%. Now, when we asked for comment, Leicestershire Police told us they carry out high numbers of vetting interviews to get a better understanding of candidates, while the Norfolk and Suffolk forces said their vetting processes are robust and taken extremely seriously. And it is important to say that these figures are just a snapshot and could also be explained by other factors. But we also looked specifically at what happened after the high-profile murder of Sarah Everard, uh, when those guidelines were revised. Now, if you look at these uh, two forces here, City of London and Bedfordshire, you can see that they both saw a big increase in candidates failing vetting when you compare 2020, which was before Sarah Everard, to 2022. But interestingly, the majority of other areas showed no significant change in rejection numbers, which, again, raises questions about whether forces are interpreting the guidelines differently. Now, in response to our findings, the National Police Chiefs Council told us that inspectors agreed with 90% of vetting decisions and that police constables have already acted to put problems right. And the Home Office says police vetting guidelines are currently being given another update, uh, but that all recruits are subject to vigorous processes. But as you can see, lots of unanswered questions. OK, Louisa, thank you. We're joined now by the... Um... HM Inspector of Constabulary, Matt Parr, he said that differences in rejection rates across forces for candidates do indicate different standards. And by retired detective Superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury, who says the serious inconsistencies in the way that officers are vetted are extremely worrying. Let's start with you, Mr Parr. This is, this is not to you a surprise that we have this variation, but it must make you very concerned. No, I think when we uh, launched the big report at the end of last year, uh, we said that too many decisions we didn't agree with and there was too much inconsistency. Uh, and so we had a series of recommendations to, to basically make it harder for the wrong people to get into the police uh, and also for the, make it easier for the wrong people to be removed from the police. And I was just looking at the, um, the, that 2022 report just to give you um, one example, or two examples. An officer cleared to join the police despite an arrest for rape while a juvenile 20 years earlier. And also, um, a police officer who was appointed despite robbing an 80-year-old woman who was knocked to the ground and had her handbag stolen. Now, what we just heard there, that um, the National Police Chief Council say that in 90% of cases, inspectors agree with the recruitment, does that mean that 10% of recruits you disagree with because they may have done offences like these? I think 10% of the, the cases we looked at, and we looked at 700 uh, case files It's a people. huge number. So it is, an, it is a large number. Um, let's be clear, that wasn't a random sample. That was the ones that forces thought we might be interested in. Right. But even so, it indicates, uh, I think, as I've said, there uh, hundreds of, of people have joined the police that we don't think should have got in. One in ten of the police officers you looked at shouldn't have joined because they did f um, crimes or other kind of issues which should have failed the vetting process. Yeah, about one in ten of the, of the, of the cases we looked at yeah. we think shouldn't have joined, and about another 10%. We can see why they might have joined, but there should have been stricter controls around them after they joined to make sure that they were, uh, that they were towing the line. And, but let's be fair that just cos you've got some bad history in your, uh, in your past uh, and your vetting might have been questionable, it doesn't follow that every one of those officers goes on to, to do anything wrong. But doesn't it follow that... We ought to go back and check. I mean, I know it would be expensive to re-vet, but if 10% of officers, 
potentially, might have committed crimes which would stop them being police officers, doesn't the public need to know that now we've uncovered this, we go back and make sure that the people who shouldn't be police officers are no longer police officers in the future? Well, it might not be 100% perfect, but I think the penny's dropped since our report um, and some of Louise's figures there showed that some forces have definitely raised the bar and made it harder to get in. To go back and... Some. Some. To go back and check I find that very reassuring, serving. to be honest. Uh, at the moment, we're going round all forces to see which of our recommendations uh, they've, 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 they've enacted and whether they've raised the bar. What would you say to North and Suffolk? One percent. Um, I, I find that difficult to understand. Well, uh, Leicestershire, I think, zero. I think we'd have to look, to be fair, at the case files to see what was going on there to understand it. Uh, but that, that's a big discrepancy, and you wouldn't expect it to be exactly the same it's in every quite course. Quite to look at the case files quite quickly. But it's, but it's a, that, 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 that takes some understanding, and it looks wrong to me. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is that vetting is not a, an absolute failsafe. Uh, it, it doesn't guarantee that the wrong people don't get in, but it's a pretty good safety net and it, sh and it needs to be done much more rigorously. Um, Shabnam Chowdhury, you served uh, 30 years in the Metropolitan Police. When you were serving, did you undergo regular vetting along with your colleagues? Well, in 30 years, I was only re-vetted once and that was at the highest levels because I had actually um, succe was successful in the job with the Olympics and so I was going into Cabinet Office. Mm. But in those 30 years, I was never, ever re-vetted and I can tell you now that the colleagues that I worked with that I was responsible for also never went underwent uh, re-vetting. And process. how often would you expect to have been re-vetted in a, in a course of three decades? Yeah, in a course of three decades, at least five or ten years. However... There's an onus on officers every year to update their process, their, their reports, in terms of whether situations have changed. So either whether it's declared associations, whether they've been convicted of a public order offence, because unless you do a criminal check on those officers, there are probably hundreds of officers within policing that are sitting there with convictions for public order offences, for drink drive, for maybe uh, some cautions, that if they don't tell their uh, leaders that this has happened, you won't know about it. What do you make... We, we know that the government is going to announce this morning whether it has hit its target of trying to get 20,000 new recruits. Are you confident about the quality of that 20,000, considering this information? Absolutely not. I think that this is a numbers game. This is about quant quantity and not quality of police officers. You only need to look at some of the officers that have either been convicted, those that are subjected to charge for mm. serious offences. Look at what happened with the murderer of Sarah Everard. He came into the Metropolitan Police in mm. 2018 despite the fact that he's referred to as the rapist. So you've not, not just got new recruits coming in that are potentially corrupt. You've also got officers that have been sitting within policing for decades that have displayed red flag behaviours yeah. who have actually got away with corruption mm. and are still sitting in policing. It's a mountain yeah. to climb. The thing climb. I find is kind of really hard to understand about this is we've had your excellent report last year which exposes this problem. We've had our survey today which shows it's still random across the country. Sarah Everard's cartel murder was two years ago. And we're still talking about the government introducing voluntary codes of conduct, which police forces may or may not to choose to enact. And we know from this survey, and you've confirmed it, Chief Inspector, that they're not all enacting these standards. Why on earth, in policing, don't we have standards which every force has to implement and allows the inspector to go and check whether they are implementing national standards of vetting. Why is this a postcode lottery? We do have national guidance. Uh, but guidance but, but is not the same as... It's not enforceable. It's not, it's not enforceable. And also, don't forget, there's got to be an element of sort of human decision-making. There's course. got to be an element of discretion. It wouldn't be fair. But you can inspect that. Uh, I mean, we can look, and, and our decisions are different to the ones, those that some forces have made. And I think that's the general point. I think... Um, I don't Wouldn't think your the job be easier if you had national standards where you knew every force was applying the same standard for vetting? Yeah, I think it would be. Can I uh, ask one specific question? Ed had mentioned in your report somebody who had been arrested but not convicted of, I think it was a sexual offence. What is the... If, if someone isn't convicted of a crime, does, but they're arrested for it, are they allowed to join the police or should they be ruled out if it's uh, a sexual offence? They are allowed to join the police. Um, 
only if they're convicted is it a kind of mm -hmm. a, a straight no. For some offences, not all. What about sexual offences? For sexual you're... offences, conviction, if you're... A, no, but a, I'm talking about arrest, not conviction. Obviously, if you're convicted, you should not be allowed you wouldn't to be allowed join to be. the police. Um, if you're arrested for a sexual offence, should you be allowed to join the police force? It's at the discretion of, of, her, of the vetting unit in the force concerned. Now, sometimes I and think... do you think that that standard is different amongst different forces? Yes. Do you yes. think uh, that... Without a doubt, standards are different, and I think there's complete inconsistency across yeah. the 43 forces, and that is why officers were allowed to join. If you and apply... do you think they should be allowed if they're arrested for a sexual offence in their past? I think each case has to be treated on its merits, but that's a very serious, very serious offence, and you need to look at the detail of that. And do you think and, that and they so should be allowed? And so few rapes are convicted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, 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 that's absolutely right. It should be case by case. Right. And, and lastly... You can see you... where the inconsistency mm. comes yeah, up, you can. can't you? Thank you. All right. can't have a blanket ban on all convictions. Oh, Thank okay. you for coming on, and um, thank you to Louisa for that excellent survey for Good Morning Britain. And...